Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ingrid Waldron. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University and uh, the director of the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project. That's the Enrich Project. And uh, my research and my teaching focus on the social and environmental determinants of health in uh, Mi'kmaq communities, African Nova Scotian communities, uh, black communities, and racialized communities. So what I'm gonna talk about today is um, the SDGs, but within uh, an environmental racism framework, uh, looking at some of the intersections of the SDGs and the work that I do uh, through the Enrich Project on those SDGs. Um, also outlining some of the um, activities and actions taken by communities to address environmental racism and health inequities. And then at the end, I talk um, about what the Enrich Project has done over the last eight years to address various intersecting SDGs like environmental contaminants, health inequities, um, and other SDGs. So first, um, I just wanna talk about some of the main objectives of my presentation. First, I wanna discuss the lens or framework that I use to analyze environmental racism. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the health impacts of environmental racism, which uh, the concept for that is uh, environmental health inequities. Um, I'm going to provide a few examples of Nova Scotian communities that have been impacted by and have been addressing over the past several decades environmental racism and health inequities in their communities, I would say over the last 70 years. Uh, and then provide, as I said earlier, an overview of what uh, the Enrich Project has been doing to address uh, environmental issues, uh, health issues, and other SDGs over the last seven years. I want to begin, however, um, with a bit of a definition of environmental racism that was articulated by one of the community members that I visited in 2013. His name is James Desmond. He's a longtime activist in the African Nova Scotian community of Lincolnville. Um, and I find uh, that he provides here a really nice, succinct definition of environmental racism. I'm going to provide you with the more academic definition a little bit later, uh, but this really sums up what environmental racism is. So as James says, uh, environmental racism is a practice of locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotia native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. So that quote packs a punch uh, because within that quote, we understand that environmental racism is about the disproportionate location of industry in racialized communities, uh, non-white communities, but also poor white communities, working class communities. Uh, when James says that these are communities that don't have a base to fight back, he's essentially talking about the issue of power. Uh, while certainly these communities have personal power, what they don't have is the access to uh, economic power, economic resources, um, and political clout. Um, so when we think of environmental racism, then it's important to think about the intersection of race and class and education um, and economics in terms of the ability or the extent to which these communities can fight back against the placement of these industries in their community. So here's a more academic definition. Um, and I would say that there are five uh, main components of environmental racism identified by Robert Bullard uh, in the United States, who is considered to be the father of environmental justice um, everywhere, worldwide. Um, he he um, started his work in the very late 1980s. So the first definition is, as I mentioned earlier, the disproportionate location and greater exposure of indigenous and racialized communities to contamination and pollution from polluting industries. So in the United States, it would be racialized communities that include Hispanic communities, Latino communities, African Americans, and indigenous communities. In Canada, I would say both in Nova Scotia and other parts of Canada, um, I would say primarily indigenous and racialized communities, but there are certainly pockets of um, other communities or communities that are not um, African Nova Scotians, Black communities and other communities that are also impacted by environmental racism. I think of a community like, um, uh, what's the community in Toronto, um, Regent Park. You know, there have been some studies that indicate that these are communities also impacted by different types of environmental racism. So 
Um, but I would say in general, indigenous communities, African Nova Scotian communities disproportionately um, impacted. I mentioned earlier that it's about the lack of political power. These are communities that don't have economic clout. They're often not heard by government. Uh, they're often invisibilized by government, but also in addition to that, they reside in remote, out of the way and rural communities. So once again, when you do those intersections of race and lack of political power, and then the fact that they're also residing in remote places, these are communities that tend to be less heard because of all of those factors, right? I certainly, you know, remote communities or rural communities don't often have access uh, to networks. Uh, they don't have access to services and they're often forgotten. So rurality or residents in rural areas is a key factor uh, in environmental racism. Third, environmental racism is about the ways in which policies are implemented that in effect sanction the harmful and in many cases life-threatening presence of poisons in these communities. So when people say to me, how can the environment be racist, you know, and they, and they laugh, they think it's ridiculous. It's not, I mean, it's a great term, environmental racism, but what it's about is that environmental policy can be racist, right? Because environmental policies are created by people who are members of the elite who often don't understand or don't think about how these policies can impact and harm uh, communities that are uh, racialized in very specific ways. So it's the ways in which racism and racist ideologies get written into environmental policy. So that's when, what, what we mean when we say environmental racism. It's about the policies that are developed. It's about the environmental assessments and how they engage with communities, how they exclude the community voice, and how they often don't consider the determinants of health. Meaning, if you are going to put an industry in a community already suffering from poverty, from income insecurity, from food insecurity, and from other social determinants of health, you have to consider how that placement of that industry could further compromise the well-being of those communities, and those things are typically not taken into account. Fourth, uh, environmental racism is about the disproportionate negative impacts of environmental policies and the differential rates of cleanup. So, you know, you have to ask the question, why does it take Indigenous communities, for example, much longer to get their concerns heard. Why does cleanup happen? Um, or why does cleanup not happen? Or why does it take longer for cleanup to happen in Indigenous communities compared to other communities? I think of a community like um, Pictou Landing First Nation in Nova Scotia and the contaminated Boat Harbor site and the fact that the community has been calling on government to clean up that site since the mid-1980s. And I'll talk about this later, but it's only until you know, it's, it's last year that our premier announced that he would close the mill, right? So why does it take certain communities longer? So it's about the rates, differential rates of cleanup. And finally, it's about the history of excluding indigenous and racialized communities from those decision-making bodies, whether it be a board at an NGO or an ENGO or regulatory bodies, any decision-making body you will not get the people who are most impacted sitting on that committee or sitting on that board. Therefore, you don't have opportunities to hear about how placing an industry in their community um, could compromise their well being. You don't get to hear from the voices of the people who are impacted. Um, and that's really crucial because when you develop policies, you want to be able to consider uh, some of the concerns that community members have. Um, um, or the ways in which they would like to be consulted. So the exclusion of the people who are most impacted allows environmental racism to manifest intergenerationally. So I want to talk a little bit about the Enrich uh, project. Um, this was a project that came to me. I was approached by an environmental activist to take on this project. I didn't know anything about environmental racism or the environment. When he approached me, I was a health researcher focusing on the social determinants of health, but definitely not the environmental determinants of health. Um, he explained what environmental racism was to me, and I thought, this sounds very intriguing. It's very political. It allows me to work with communities that I've already been working with, like Indigenous and Black communities. There's something slightly controversial about it. You know, I was a bit thirsty for a new challenge, and I said to myself, this looks like a challenge, so let me do it. 
So that, uh, so the project began in 2012 in the spring. We got a grant that um, allowed us the opportunity to meet with community. It was a team development grant. So we're building a team um, in the fall of 2012 and then decided to do uh, community workshops to get to know the communities and meet the communities. What I found though in um, starting this project was that I wanted to have a different lens. What I noticed uh, in Canada and uh, in Nova Scotia that everybody was talking about environmental justice, justice, justice. And I'm thinking, well, you can't really talk about justice until you talk about the illness. And the illness is the racism, the illness or the condition or the diagnosis is environmental racism. We can talk about the justice, but we can't talk about it yet until we understand the underlying reasons for why environmental racism manifests in Canada. So I think what makes my project different from most or all projects in Canada is that I center race. I don't center justice. Justice is part of it. Justice includes the tools, the apparatus that you need to use in order to address it, but you don't know how to address it unless you, unless you understand what's causing it. Uh, so in, in seeking to center race, and certainly of course class and gender and other social determinants of health in my project, I feel that I've come up with a very unique project that centers the voices of people who are specifically uh, racialized. So one of the things I wanted to do through um, my project is to have kind of an alternative lens one that engages with the environmental justice lens, but also says, hey, we need to talk about environmental racism first. We need to have a full, in-depth, critical dialogue on how race is implicated in environmental policy making, how racism gets embedded within policies, how it gets written into policies, um, and how decision making is extremely racialized and classed and gendered. Um, and then when we are able to look at those intersections with race as the central entry point, then we understand environmental racism in its full breadth. And then we understand how to use the environmental justice tools to address it. I also felt that it needed to be community based. I didn't want this to be an academic project solely. Certainly it's academic. It's coming out of Dalhousie University. But I also knew that this is a project that needed to be driven by community members. They needed to, to lead it. And what often happens with academics is that we are trained to be in control. It's very difficult. And sometimes it's not something that we're doing to harm people, but we're kind of trained as academics. We need to lead, we need to be in control. We are the principal investigators. And I said to myself, I need to relax. I need to allow the communities to tell me what they want and I need them to drive it. But I need to be there in order to provide them with the resources and tools that will help them. Those resources and tools could be the fact that I happen to have a network of people, of environmental professionals that could test their water, or I have, access to, uh, I have access to funding that I could use to support them. So that's what I see as my role, is that they're leading it, they're driving it to community members, uh, they're creating the research objectives and the research questions that I'm there to support. Um, and this too, for me, is a very unique aspect of the Enrich Project, where I'm not seeking to overtake that I respect the fact that these are communities that have been addressing environmental racism longer than I have, right? I've been doing it for eight years. In many cases, these are communities um, who have been addressing this issue since the late 1960s. I also said to myself, I needed this to be intersectional. I needed to address the political issues. I needed to address the economic issues. I needed to address the social issues as well as the health issues. So it's an intersectional, a project that looks at addressing all of those issues with, with health, I would say, at the forefront, because that is my main interest. Um, and then as I learned more about the sustainable development goals, and I think certainly that's come to the fore in the past few years, I recognize that I was addressing many intersecting uh, SDGs um, through this project with, once again, health being at the center. So these are the 17, as you know, uh, sustainable development goals. I wouldn't say that I'm addressing every single one, but the ones that I am addressing, uh, I have been addressing over the past several years, include ensuring healthy lives, um, and promoting well-being, um, ensuring inclusive and quality education for all, and promoting lifelong learning. I'll talk about that later. Um, ensuring access to clean water and sanitation ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, 
And finally, building resilient infrastructure, promoting sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. I said finally, but there are a few more. Reducing inequality within Nova Scotia specifically, making cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, taking urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts, and promoting just, peaceful, and inclusive society. So I would say that the Enrich Project um, addresses uh, all of those SDGs. I talked earlier about health being uh, my main interest. And, um, you know, I felt that one of the things that was important about the Enrich Project is that I provide evidence about the health impacts. Uh, when I started the project and I visited the uh, Nova Scotia Environment, Department of Environment, I didn't have anything to my name at that point. I didn't have a book, I hadn't published, I was very new to this project. And what they said to me was, um, where's your proof? Where's your evidence? You say, Dr. Waldron, that there are health impacts, that these are communities with high rates of cancer and you're claiming that it's perhaps due to the presence of a landfill or other environmental hazards in their communities, where's your proof? So um, I felt that, it, first of all, in terms of writing my book in 2018, I lay out um, some of the most prominent studies on the health impacts of environmental racism from scholars in Canada and the United States. Uh, so this is really the thrust of my project is to look at the connection between pollutants and health outcomes. Um, which is called environmental health inequities. And the literature has shown, uh, right here we've got some uh, Canadian scholars, um, has shown that um, there are environmental health inequities across racial dimensions. And those have been documented in the literature over the past, I would say, 20 years. There are health risks, specific health risks associated uh, with living near to polluting industries. Uh, some of these health risks um, that have been noted in the literature, but also have been articulated by community members that I have partnered with include uh, cancer, of course, upper respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, reproductive morbidity, including preterm births, allergies, skin rashes, abdominal pain, temporary liver dysfunction, and seizures. I also looked to a report by Consmo and Pacheco, a fantastic community-based report uh, that came out in 2015 when they, where they say in that report, everything connected to the land is connected to our bodies. And I, I believe this uh, with all my being. And the communities that I work with also understand that health um, is holistic and that what is happening on the land what is happening in our environment has a direct connection to what's happening in our bodies. Uh, so it's through that kind of quote uh, that I conduct my research. I also recognize that the communities I work with, like Indigenous communities, particularly Indigenous knowledge, understand the connectedness between the spirit, the mind, the body, the physical being, animals, plants. And that is um, a perspective that I hold. Um, so I think it's really important to look more at the connection between the environment, um, the spiritual aspect, um, and the body. And uh, that work is certainly increasing in Canada, but I, I felt that when I started the project, I didn't see enough work on environmental health and equity, so I wanted to contribute to the literature in that area. So I, as I said earlier, um, I'm certainly, um, I'm certainly coming in uh, with this project. Um, you know, I came into I came to this project eight years ago, and the communities have been dealing with these issues way before I started my project. So I wanted to highlight here uh, what's been happening in Nova Scotia, uh, specifically with Indigenous and African Nova Scotian communities, and how they have been fighting back against the presence of pollutants um, in their communities. So the first slide here is uh, Sabaganagadi. Um, and Tobago and Nagadi, I would say over the past six years, have been trying to address um, a project um, by Alton Gas um, that would implement uh, a brine discharge pipeline near to the Shubanagadi River in Nova Scotia. So eight years ago, Alton Gas Natural Storage applied to the Nova Scotia government to implement that project and that would allow natural gas to be stored in underground salt caverns. Um, 
the, the community has been to court and have done a lot of different resistance activities over the past eight years uh, to address this. Um, they went to the highest court, for example, earlier this year for the latest step in their ongoing opposition to this uh, project. Um, in March 2020 of this year, Justice Frank Edwards ruled that he would be reversing the decision made by Nova Scotia's former environment minister, Margaret Miller, to approve the Alton gas storage based on her contention that the province had properly consulted with the indigenous community. So her contention and the reason why she approved the project is because she believed that Alton Gas had properly, and also the government, the associate government, had properly consulted with this community. And this community has been saying for years, you have not properly consulted uh, with us. You've consulted with some people, but not all of us, and we don't approve this project. So Margaret Miller's decision was overturned, which was very much a victory uh, for, for Sabaganagadi and other indigenous communities. Uh, in Nova Scotia. So it's great to hear that they are actually making strides because this has been a kind of eight year struggle for that community. The other community that's gotten a lot of attention is Kitulani First Nation. Um, they have been dealing with a contaminated boat harbor since 1967. Uh, Kitulani First Nation was once a fertile hunting and fishing ground, as well as a sacred burial ground until 1967 when a pulp mill came into their community, Northern Pulp, and, and started, um, you know, the, the contaminants started flowing into Boat Harbor. And Boat Harbor then turned into a very highly toxic site, which has resulted in environmental degradation and extremely high rates of cancer in that community and respiratory illness. So they've been fighting against that since 1967, but specifically since the mid-1980s when they have been dealing with broken promises by the government. Since the mid-1980s, the government has said in various uh, instances that they were going to close down the mill, but that never happened. It finally happened in December of last year. In December 2019, I would say the week of Christmas, um, Premier Stephen McNeil ordered the mill to shut down at the end of January 2020, which did happen, uh, because he felt that the environmental assessment was not done um, correctly or was not up to snuff. And he said during his press conference that I've given you five years to ensure that that environmental assessment uh, was rigorous and it's not rigorous. Uh, so we can't keep doing this to this community. We can't keep um, sending them broken promises. We've been doing that since the mid 80s. So it's important that we close down the mill. The mill was closed um, January 31st of this year. I want to provide a historical example of environmental racism. This is Africville. Many of you have probably heard of this. Uh, both an example of environmental racism, but also gentrification. Um, in the mid 1960s, the city of Halifax wanted to use Africville for industrial development. And in 1947, it rezoned Africville into industrial land. By 1965, the city of Halifax had embarked on what is called an urban renewal campaign, which resulted in the, appropriate, in the expropri expropriation and bulldozing of homes and the forcible displacement of Africville residents. In fact, one, one night, they actually burned down uh, the community church you know, and, a and the church, of course, is very important to African Nova Scotian communities, but it was a way of trying to um, get the community out of there because they wanted to make way for industrial development. What was left in its wake was several examples of environmental hazards in turning this community into an industrial zone. Some of these industrial hazards included a fertilizer plant, a slaughterhouse, a tar factory, a stone and coal crushing plant, a cotton factory, a prison, two infectious disease hospitals, and three systems of rail railway tracks. In the 1950s, the city also built an open pit dump in Africville, which many, of course, consider to be an environmental hazard or an environmental menace. While this is a historical case of environmental racism, in recent times, 
uh, descendants of Africville have come together in order to request a class action lawsuit. So in November 2016, up to 300 former residents of Africville and their descendants joined a lawsuit against the city of Halifax um, over the loss of their land four decades ago. Um, unfortunately, that request for a class action lawsuit was rejected in 2018. I think the community is still trying to find ways uh, to, to address the issue. I haven't heard anything in recent times. Uh, the last thing I heard was in 2018 that it was rejected. So I'm not sure what they're planning uh, at this point. We've got a current case of environmental racism in another African Nova Scotian community. This is Lincolnville. I showed you a picture of uh, James Desmond earlier, who provided a great definition of environmental racism. This is the community he's from. This is a community that has had to contend with two landfills since 1974, a first generation landfill in 1974 and a second generation landfill in, in 2006. So the community, the second generation landfill was placed over the first generation landfill. So the community, of course, is concerned about contaminated water leaking into the second generation landfill from the first generation landfill. Similar to other communities that I work with, this is a community with extremely high rates of cancer. Um, they've come together um, in order to address this and they have a community group um, that has been addressed, trying to address the issue uh, with the municipality. They have been very concerned about these landfills because at one time, that landfill um, had um, dead horses and other animals, transformers that leaked PCBs into the ground, and over 15,000 bags of industrial waste associated with beach cleanup. So of course, they're very concerned about the health impacts. So the Lincolnville Reserve Land Voice Council is the community group that has come together to try to address it. In 2016, they started uh, collaborating um, with, uh, the, with Eco Justice, which is a Canadian law charity that has different offices across Canada to look into how they can address the issue legally. Um, and uh, I've uh, I kind of fostered the relationship, first of all, with the Calgary office in 2016 with Lincolnville, but currently Lincolnville is working with uh, the, the Halifax Ecojustice office, which opened recently in 2018. Um, I've also tried to foster relationship uh, between the community and other environmental scientists who are currently um, conducting water testing projects uh, in Lincolnville. Uh, one was completed in 2016 and we're looking to do a second round of testing. So we're trying to find different ways of um, addressing their concerns. The other African Nova Scotian community is Shelburne. Shelburne has had a landfill in their community since 1947. And in at the end of 2015, I wanted to look at uh, the issue of environmental racism in Shelburne and I decided that I would hire a community leader from Shelburne, and that's the woman in the middle. Uh, she's phenomenal. Her name is Louise DeLille, and you can see she's holding a Nova Scotia Human Rights Award for the great work she has been doing um, over the past few years to address the health impacts and the social impacts of the landfill in her community. Um, so as I said, that's a community that has been dealing with uh, the Shelburne Town Dump, which that's what they call it in the community since the late 19. Uh, 40s and trying to raise awareness about it. They also have extremely high rates of cancer. So when I met with Louise in 2015, one of the first things she said to me is, Ingrid, do you think the landfill is causing the high rates of cancer in my community because 95% of the people in my community have cancer? And one of the things I never say to people is, yes, definitely, it's the landfill, right? Because I was, I was told that at the beginning of my project, Ingrid, never say definitely. You can certainly say highly likely, for example, if a landfill is one kilometer away from a community and the community has high rates of cancer, perhaps it's highly likely uh, that, those high, that, that the high rates of cancer is caused by the landfill. But I've learned over the years never to say definitively that uh, that landfill is causing the cancer. But I did find it quite stunning when I met with her that she told me 95% of, of uh, the black community has cancer 
and that they have rare cancer, like multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. Um, so I thought, oh, this is a community I definitely want to work with because there are serious health issues. Um, so similar to Lincolnville, uh, we've done water testing projects uh, in Shelburne. We did uh, the first one in 2018. I also put them in contact with EcoJustice, so they're looking at legal remedies to address it. Um, and they're also uh, trying to address other public infrastructure issues. Um, as you know, a lot of rural communities, so these are all rural communities, rural communities tend to be on well water. What to me the injustice is in Shelburne is that the white community, which is primarily in the north of Shelburne, is on municipal water, has always been on town water. The black community, which is primarily in the south end of uh, Shelburne, has always been on well water. They've never enjoyed municipal water. That seems to be okay with the people in the north, north end of Shelburne, but it's not okay for the people in the south end of Shelburne. So that's a public infrastructure inequality to me. Um, and this is a community, and Louise in particular has been trying to address that. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but Ellen Page, actress who I've worked with on the do documentary, was kind enough to donate a community well in February to this community after a lot of back and forth with the town council. They didn't want this to happen to be honest with you. They didn't want it to happen because they thought that if a community well is placed in the black community, they said the black community is never going to use it. You might as well place it in the north end of the of Shelburne because we're going to use it. The black community is not going to use it. So there was a lot of back and forth. Finally, um, in February, uh, the mayor said, fine, you can have the community well. This community well is being paid for in full uh, by Ellen Page shouldn't have to resort to having Ellen Page and actress do that. They should have had their well, uh, but it's great that Ellen Page uh, offered to do it and that it's been approved. But this is something I think that the town uh, should have um, provided the community with, um, not an actress. <laughs> so um, I want to now talk about what I, through the Enrich Project and all of the partners that I've been working with have been doing to address environmental racism in multiple ways. I see the importance of partnership, and I think that's another SDG. Um, I could not have done this project. I cannot do this project without partnerships. I'm a sociologist. I don't know a thing about water testing. Um, I can't talk too much about environmental contaminants because I'm not an environmental scientist, right? Um, so what I do is I bring in people who have that expertise. What I give to the project is an understanding of inequality as a sociologist. I am a sociologist who focuses on race, on racism, on classism, on colonialism. That's what I bring. That's the lens that I bring. But you know, I need to have partners to work with in order to address uh, the issue of environmental racism in multiple ways. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, right now and what have I been doing over the past few years. One of the first things that I thought I needed to do was to raise awareness about environmental racism. I have done a lot of community events. I've done a lot of public engagement events in Halifax and across Canada because one of the first questions I was asked when I started the project was, what's environmental racism? I don't understand what it is. What is it? So I thought, okay, we need some awareness raising. So I continue to do that. Um, and this is one of the uh, events that I held in 2015. And what I try to do as anybody wants to, you know, anybody needs to do, of course, you want to provide different perspectives. So I have a political perspective. Here is Lenore Zan, who's standing up in the pink outfit, is at that time was an MLA, a politician. Um, I have, so what, what you see there is uh, Doreen Bernard sitting in the black. She's an indigenous Mi'kmaq community activist around the Alton gas issue that I talked about. Next to her is uh, Caroline from the Halifax Partnership, that's government. In the middle, you see Mary Desmond from the African Nova Scotian community of Lincolnville. And then in the green, you see noted activist Lynn Jones, right? So what I try to do in all these events is to bring both the black community and the indigenous community together, but also people who can provide a different perspective on health or on government or politics or legislation. It was also important for me to write a book right because i felt that i needed to address the questions that i that i was getting from government and from from the public right so i i go back to the comment made by nova scotia environment where, where they said to me where's your proof dr waldron you say it's a health issue where's your proof so 
I decided that this book would be a response uh, to people who questioned me <laughs> or were doubtful about the existence of environmental racism. So I put everything in this one book. Um, this book uh, provides a kind of colonial uh, perspective, intersectional perspective on environmental racism. There's a whole chapter on environmental health inequities. There's a whole chapter on community resistance over the past several decades. Um, so it's a book that wants to look at environmental racism from, a, from multiple perspectives um, and that provides people with insight into how, not just myself, but how Canadian scholars over the past few years have been writing about environmental contaminants in Indigenous um, and Black communities. Of course, the book is also based on community-based research, right? So I also have a chapter talking about how does one go about doing community-based research? But I also wanted to be honest. I wanted people to know about my missteps, right? Because when I started this project, I wasn't an expert on community-based research. Sometimes people think that you're just an expert. And I was educated at uh, University of Toronto. I wasn't trained on how to do community-based research. I got the same education as everybody else, right? So. I was actually struggling with how to do this, that I needed to center the community voice, I needed the community to lead my project. I was learning, you know, and I made a lot of mistakes and the communities weren't shy to tell me that I was making a mistake. So what I put in my book is, what do you need to think about when you are engaging communities um, and when you're rushing to do the work because you gotta put in that ethics application? And at some point that ethics application has to wait because the community isn't ready. How do you read the temperature of that community? Do they want you to come into their community? Maybe they don't. I mean, there's information in my book where I talk about the struggles I had connecting with people landing First Nation because they simply did not want another academic study coming into their community. How did I deal with that? So I felt it was important to be transparent about the struggles that I had doing this kind of research, community-based research, so other people can learn from that. Legislation has really been important. Um, I pointed to Lenore Zan earlier, the woman in pink who was standing up during that community event. She was an MLA for the NDP. She is now an, um, an MP for the Liberal Party. But at that time when I met her, when she was an NDP MLA, um, I was reaching out to a lot of different politicians. I thought to myself, how can I get politicians involved? How could they help me? How can they support me? So I spent the Christmas week of 2014 calling, leaving messages for, and also following up with politicians. And one of the first uh, politicians who got back to me was Lenore Zan. And we met for coffee. And I just wanted to kind of have a discussion about how she could support. I wasn't thinking about a bill. That's the first, that was the first, furthest thing from my mind. But she brought it up and she said, why don't we just develop a bill? And I said, well, that sounds great. I wasn't expecting that, but that sounds pretty cool. She said, yeah, I gotta say to you though, that uh, in um, um, private members bills, they don't tend to ever pass into law, but what it can do is bring more attention to the issue of environmental racism and we can do a press conference and we can get into the newspapers and we can bring more attention to this, to this issue. But I don't want you to get your hopes up high because the bill probably will not pass. And I said, well, that sounds great to me. And everything she said did happen, right? The bill didn't pass. It was introduced in the legislature, the Nova Scotia legislature in April, 2015. It did go to second reading, but it didn't go to that third stage, which is law amendments which would have perhaps allowed it to go further and to, be got, to become legislation. But what it did do is it did provide more information about environmental racism and raised awareness. We got into all the major newspapers here and people started to talk about environmental racism a lot more. Uh, so I think, our goal, I think we kind of achieved our goal. Um, that bill, has been reintroduced every single year since 2015, thanks to Lenore Zan. The last time being 2018, the bill is now called Bill 31. It was called in 2015, Bill 111. Um, but the last time it was reintroduced was 2018. Since then, Lenore Zan switched over to the Liberal Party. Um, she's now an MP, as I said, and she contacted me earlier this year and she says, Ingrid, you know what? 
I think I want to put forward a federal environmental racism bill based on the bill you and I developed in 2015. What do you think about that? I said, this is fantastic. And she said, you see why I moved to the Liberal Party? You know, because now I have some power. I said, yep. I didn't like it at the beginning, but this, this was a good move on your part. So on February 26th of this year, using the bill that we had developed in 2015, with some revisions, of course, uh, Lenore introduced into the House of Commons uh, a federal environmental racism bill, which I believe is called Bill C-230. Um, it's called a national strategy to redress environmental racism. Now our plan, or her plan, was to put it forward to second reading. She got a lot of support from Elizabeth May and other people in her party, but then the pandemic hit, right? So before the pandemic hit, she was extremely hopeful. We were communicating on email. She said, Ingrid, I think this bill is gonna stick. I think this one is gonna stick. You know, I'm gonna put it to, um, to second reading. I'm getting a lot of support and then the pandemic hit. So I spoke with her about four weeks ago and I said, what's happening? What's the status? What are we gonna do? There's a pandemic. And she said, well, right now the focus is on the pandemic. Um, but I'm going to keep you up to date and in the loop. So I don't know yet what's going to happen uh, with this bill, but I remain hopeful. I mentioned earlier that I am not an expert on um, pollutants and contaminants and testing, but I did find that it was important to actually create an NGO that could actually give the communities I was working with a win of sorts. At one of my events, um, an environmental scientist uh, a geologist was sitting in the audience and he contacted me after my event. He said, I enjoyed your, I really enjoyed your event, but I really think we need to consider ways to give these communities a win. And I said, well, what would that look like? And he said, well, I think we should test their water. That's an immediate type of uh, win and you're giving something back to the community. And I said, that sounds like a great idea. So we, we forged um, a committee what we call the Water Testing Committee. We hadn't um, created this NGO as yet. And that's when we implemented that water testing project in Lincolnville and we thought, oh, this really worked well. You know, we were able to test their water for the first time ever, provide them with results of water testing for the first time ever, show them how to and train them on testing their own water and also train students on testing water environmental science students. So we thought this is a really great template. This is a great blueprint. We need to use this again. So in 2017, we came together, myself and this environmental scientist or geologist and other environmental scientists, and we decided that we needed to create an NGO. And the NGO would not be involved in the kind of political, social health issues that the Enrich Project is involved in. We wanted to separate it. So Enrich would be involved in the activism and the advocacy and the political issues and all that stuff. I would do that stuff separate. But this NGO would focus specifically on water testing in rural Nova Scotian communities. This NGO is called Rural Water Watch. And we have several missions to test water in Nova Scotian rural communities, specifically indigenous and black communities, to show community members how to test their own water to train environmental science students on how to test water, but also to do workshops in the communities. Right now, we are involved in well workshops, showing community members how to keep your well healthy. Because when I think back to Shelburne, you know, there's contaminants in their well water, but a lot of that also has to do with the fact that people don't know, most of us don't know how to keep our wells healthy. So we are engaged right now in a series of workshops which have been pretty successful. We were surprised that a lot of people were coming out because this is a pretty dry topic, but uh, people want to learn about how to keep their wells healthy. So I'm very excited about this NGO. Uh, surprisingly, we got funding from Nova Scotia Environment. We thought we wouldn't, um, but I think they recognize that rural communities are underserved. Uh, we recently got some more funding about a month ago uh, to do some workshops and to do some further testing. So what has been great about this is that we were able to tell Shelburne and Lincolnville exactly what's in their water, but also how to manage their water. As I said earlier, I've been working with EcoJustice since 2016. I forged a relationship between EcoJustice, Lincolnville, um, Shelburne and the indigenous communities, and they are all looking at legal remedies, whether it be a class action lawsuit or private prosecution or looking at whether or not environmental racism is a violation of the Canadian human rights law, 
based on race and class, et cetera. They are currently working with these communities to address their issues uh, legally. Another exciting project, you know, I talked earlier about I'm addressing the SDG of learning and teaching. Um, I forge a relationship with two young women who are graduates of Dalhousie's environmental science program. And they wanted to work with me on seeing how we can change the high school and middle school curriculum. Um, we, we agreed that environmental racism is not taught in the school system, in the high school and middle school system. And surely, if our future leaders are people who are currently in high school, then we needed to change the, the lens that they're using. And one of the reasons why environmental racism continues is because the people in power right now at Nova Scotia Environment, to me, don't have the correct lens, right? So if they say things to me like, well, there's no racism, then to me, that tells me that they don't really understand what racism is. They don't understand the subtleties of racism. They don't understand why you, you need to look at colonialism in order to understand what's happening today. I want young people to have the correct lens because they're the future leaders. So we thought we need to get into the school system. So we forged this relationship now in a project that we're doing to do two things. The first thing is to develop online tools for high school and middle school teachers to use in the classroom to teach students about environmental racism. Those tools will be social media, poetry, spoken word, music, graphic art, anything that's creative and innovative because we know that young people are online so that these tools have to be online so that's the first thing that we want to do the second thing that we want to do which is pretty challenging um, is to kind of change the school curriculum you know how do we change what's being taught we did do an environmental scan and we did notice that there is a gap while sustainability is being taught to some extent environmental racism and environmental justice through the lens that I think is important is not being taught in the school curricula. So this is what we wanna do. We wanna get into the school curricula, but we're doing it from a community focus lens, right? We're doing workshops in indigenous communities and black communities first, so they can tell us what they think should be in the high school and middle school curricula. We had our first workshop last year, and then of course the pandemic hit, but our objective is to visit different indigenous communities um, to have them lead those workshops and for them to tell us what they think should be included in the high school curriculum. So I see a difference between environmental racism, of course, and environmental justice and sustainable issues because I don't think sustainability adequately addresses inequities, right? I think it's a safe term that really doesn't get at inequalities and how people experience the environment in different ways, particularly racialized bodies. So I want this to be critical and I don't want it to be around a framework around sustainability. I want, I want it to challenge uh, notions of sustainability that actually exclude discussions on race. I also work with the Ecology Action Center. They're very much focused on climate change and uh, I've worked with them uh, to look at climate change, particularly in developing a 2030 declaration. That declaration that we worked on two years ago with a lot of different community organizations across Nova Scotia is calling on the government of Nova Scotia to set strong greenhouse gas targets below 1990 levels by 2030. And in so doing, transition to a low carbon economy. We, will, we also want to impress upon government the urgency in meeting this target and transitioning our economy in a way that recognize, recognizes the structural inequities of race, gender, class, income, and the ongoing impacts of colonialization and environmental racism in our province. I've also recently forged a relationship with Nova Scotia Health Authority um, in order to kind of look at climate change as well. They reached out to me in October of last year. Uh, they're interested in the Enrich project, but they're also interested in the NGO that I formed, uh, Rural Water Watch. They wanna work with Rural Water Watch and the Enrich project to put on workshops that look at the link between climate change and the social determinants of health. It's been, it's been really tough for me to forge relationships, I feel, with health departments. I don't know why. I don't think environmental issues are seen as 
significant for the health department in Nova Scotia. I think there's a separation. Nova Scotia environment deals with the environmental issues and the health department doesn't. And I would like to see a coming together um, so that we can address both the issue of the environment and health. And that to me hasn't happened. So I was really surprised when they reached out to me in October and I immediately said yes. So our first task is to put on workshops, uh, specifically in African Nova Scotian communities, because I feel the African Nova Scotian community is less engaged in environmental issues in general, but also on the issue of climate change. Um, so they have connections in the seniors community, in one community in the African Nova Scotian community, and they're gonna leverage their partnership with that community. And I'm also gonna come in with my partners and we're gonna, we're going to look at how we could uh, um, do those workshops. Of course, once again, the pandemic <laughs> kind of stopped us in our tracks. Um, we were supposed to begin discussions uh, early this year, so that's not, obviously didn't happen. So uh, we are still in contact. Um, in terms of talking about how we can move forward on this. Interestingly, at the same time, I was, uh, uh, some retired environmental professionals reached out to me about a week later um, from um, an organization or service called Climate Action Services. And they said, we would like to do some workshops with you with the Enrich Project on climate change. And I said, oh, that's really convenient because I was contacted by Nova Scotia Health Authority a week ago and they also want to do the same thing so so there's no redundancy why don't we all do it together i'm really interested in partnerships you know i just feel that the enrich project has survived because of these really great partnerships so we are all going to partner now together Climate action services and nova scotia health authority and myself and once again you know the pandemic hit so Climate action services uh, is trying to come up with ways that we could still start the discussion um, but we can't really, of course, enter the communities at, at this point, but we can certainly begin discussions on how we can work uh, together. They have already done workshops on climate change in Indigenous communities, so they have a great template that we can use to work with the African Nova Scotian community. Part of my job is also training. This is a part that I really love because the Enrich Project, and of course, any environmental issue, is so intersectional and so interdisciplinary, as all of you know, because you're working in this field of SDGs, it's so intersectional. And I will learn so much from the intersectional, interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral nature of environmental issues. And it means that I get to work with students in law, students in sustainability, students in environmental science, students in medicine, students in sociology, students in political science, students in nursing. Over the past eight years, I've worked with professors and students in all of those disciplines because they see themselves in some aspect of the Enrich Project. You know, the legislation part and the bills, the law students are attracted to that. Of course, the health and medical students are attracted to that. I forgot to mention planning students, of course. There's that angle. So what has really been enriching for me is providing opportunities for students to be trained in different ways and they all want different things. Some students just want to do a literature review. Other students actually want to do uh, civil disobedience and action and advocacy and activism. So because I have those relationships with some of the communities, I'm able to provide them with those connections. So it's been really um, exciting to work with this type of diversity. A key aspect of my project is knowledge sharing. We know as academics that knowledge sharing is key. You can do all the research that you want, but if you're not sharing it in the appropriate ways to the appropriate people, your research means absolutely nothing, right? So for me, I need to share it with the health policy makers and the ENGOs and the academics and the community members. And for me, this is the most exciting part of any study is to figure out how do I target particular people and how do I inform policy? And how do I inform activism? And how do I need to reach out to people in different ways? And I need to recognize that, you know, some of the people in Lincolnville aren't on the internet. So how do I get to them? And does a health policy maker want to receive information in the same way as a community member? No, right? So we need to think about how we target people differently, just like somebody who is in marketing or advertising, right? Um, you need to target people in very specific ways. So I find that's a very exciting, um, extremely exciting part 
when you get to the end of your study to think about how that could happen. So uh, I mean, doc Dr. Yeah. Waldron, sorry, I'm just gonna let everybody know we're about to wrap this up and then head over to the main plenary. So we've just got uh, about a minute left. Okay. So one of the things that I've done, of course, is a documentary film um, with Ellen Page in 2019. She reached out to me in 2018 through Twitter and we came up with the idea of doing a documentary. That documentary was screened at the Toronto International Film Festival and it's now on Netflix. It's been streaming on Netflix since 2018. So that has been a very powerful way to get the message across, of course, because a lot of people around the world are on Netflix, have access to Netflix. So that was based on, the movie is based on the book that I wrote that I talked about earlier. Here we are at uh, TIFF, Toronto International Film Festival in September of last year. And as I said, we're on Netflix now, streaming since March 27th. Um, and this is the poster, the promo poster uh, for Netflix. Um, and, you know, since, since uh, the release of the film, we've had some really great responses from people all over the world who have been very inspired by the women who are featured in that film. And that is actually what I wanted to do with this film. I want people to know more about environmental racism around the world. I want them to know how it manifests in Canada and Nova Scotia, but I want people to be inspired. And these women are inspiring. It's a very feminist take on environmental racism. All, everybody in the film is a woman showing you how she's doing it in her community. And um, I feel that young indigenous women and young black women and young white women and young green women, doesn't matter, will be extremely inspired by women who are seemingly doing very simple things in their community, but the things that they're doing are extremely powerful. Um, so I'd like to thank you for listening and looking forward to your comments.